Hey there, welcome to Board Gems. I'm Daryl Boone, coming to you from the beautiful Pacific Northwest of North America, Cascadia, um, Vancouver, British Columbia in my case. Pacific Northwest, beautiful place, right? Uh, where First Blood was filmed. If you're ever in the area, visit Hope, BC. That's where Rambo First Blood was filmed. Is really the only thing Hope is famous for, but they lean into it a lot. So this is where I got this shirt. Beautiful place. Now, if you knew me, and admittedly you don't, I mean, do you really know me? Like, really? This is all a facade. I'm crying inside. Um, if you knew me and you don't, but if you did, you might know that my favorite publisher probably is Hans and Gluck. Really consistently good quality games uh, coming out from that German company. In English, you, you used to see them from Rio Grande games and then now from Z-Man games, but you know, the editorial content is Hans and Gluck, and they've made some wonderful games in the past. Most recently, they'd be famous for kind of bigger, heavier games like Russian Railroads and uh, Marco Polo. Um, but if you go back to the 2000s, so from 2000, 2010, thereabouts, uh, they made a, a lot of really nice family strategy games, a little bit of next step game. So they're most famous for Carcassonne, which is a pretty light family strategy game. But a lot of their games that came out in that period of time were really aiming at that market, maybe just a little bit higher, like just a little bit more involved than Carcassonne. And they released some really great family strategy board games in that period of time. Um, you're looking at Finca and Vikings and Turn and Taxis and Stone Age and, and so many great games. And there's probably a bunch of those that I'll cover for board gems, the, the less famous ones. Um, this week, I'm going to talk about Oregon, which happens to be my wife's favorite game, so I think it's worthwhile to cover. Now, as I said, it's published by Hans M. Gluck. It's designed by Osa and Hendrik Berg. Uh, it's for two to four players, ages eight and up, and takes about 45 minutes to play. The age range is kind of borderline. I'd almost go, it's a little bit more complicated than Carcassonne, which is also eight and up. Uh, it came out, I want to say about 2007. So again, this is in the same family as games like Finca and Vikings and Turn and Taxis and Stone Age, uh, games that are family friendly, but that have a little bit of something extra. I'm gonna show you how it plays first, then afterwards, let's talk about why it's a gem. To set up the game, you're gonna set up the board up here on the table between the players. You're going to mix up these tokens. These are uh, coal and gold, and you're going to mix them all up face down. Uh, the coal tokens are numbered one to three, and the gold tokens are numbered three to five. But you're going to mix those up face down. You're going to place stacks of four each of each of the seven different types of buildings, and I'll explain the different buildings um, in a little bit, but you're going to just stack them to the side for now. And there's one more of each building which has a red back. You'll see the backs of these are just the same as the fronts, but these ones have a special back. So you're going to mix these all up and you're going to give one face down to each player and the rest are gonna go out of the game. Each player gets 15 or so pawns, one of which will start on the zero slash 100 space there. And each player also gets these two tokens. They're double-sided. You can see they have, they have an X on them. So they're, they're one-time use special powers, but the one time at a time. Once you use the action, they'll flip over, but you're able to uh, turn it face up again to use later. So we'll talk about these in a bit. And finally, there's two decks of cards. This smaller deck, shows buildings and you'll see there's a there are cards for each of the buildings you're going to shuffle this up and give one to each player put the rest of the side the other ones the larger deck shows one of five symbols and they match the symbols on the side of the board and at the top of the board you're going to shuffle these up and give three to each player now determine a start player there's no start player marker, just remember who it is. Uh, players will all have an equal number of turns. The goal of the game is to get the most points. You get points 
by placing your pawns next to buildings and by placing buildings next to your pawns. Either way, you're going to score points. And so what you're going to see is little communities forming. You know, people, people are going to be adding the buildings and then they're going to be adding people next to the buildings and they're going to be adding buildings next to the people. And as you can see, you, you'll see these little, almost like little communities forming on the board. But to start, starting with the start player, each player takes their building, their starting building that they've been dealt at the start of the game and place it on any space on the board that matches the same color, the same back. You see, there's three different, this is technically four different types, but there's, there's kind of grass forest area, there's railway tracks, and there's mountains. There's also water, but you can't place anything in the water. So you cannot place a church on a railway track or a mountain, but you can place it on any green space you want. And generally you'll do this after you look at your cards. So all the players do that. And then play begins. Now on your turn, you are going to play two cards, generally speaking. So when you start the game, you're gonna start with three cards that match these symbols and a building card. And you can play a combination of two cards. If you play two symbols, you're going to place a pawn. And if you place a symbol and a building, you're going to place a building. So to place a pawn, you, pl you take two of these cards, two symbol cards, and you find their connection. So you play them and then you look and see. So this is a covered wagon and campfire. See, here's covered wagon and here's campfire. And there's six spaces in here, but there's also this symbol and this symbol. So it's also these spaces here. The player who plays the card can choose which is the row and which is the column. And then they can play a pawn in any of the six spaces that, can, that, um, that intersects. So they could play the pawn on any of these six spaces or on any of these six spaces. Again, you can't place in the water. Now, if you place a pawn next to a building, you get the benefit of that building, which is usually points, but there's, it's almost always points, um, but there's also some little extra things that can sometimes happen. But this number here is how many points you get. So in this case, this player would get one point. Now, if you play, instead you play a symbol and a building, you take one of the buildings that matches that card and you place it in the row or column matching that symbol but again, the background has to match. So this is a post office. You can't place the post office um, on railway or mountain. It has to go on a green space, but you can place it on any row or column that matches the eagle. So if, for example, the player were to place it here, there, that's an eagle, or here, which is coincidentally both eagle, but that's not necessary. It just has to match the row or column for placing a building. And any pawns that are next to that building are going to score points. Next to includes, a, uh, includes diagonal. So if yellow is here and you place this building here, then both blue and yellow are going to score three points. Placing a pawn allows you to score every building around it in that radius, those eight spaces. So placing a yellow pawn here would score the yellow player four points. You can also get bonus points by connecting groups of your pawns. Whenever you have a connected group of three or more pawns, and in this case, diagonally does not count. It can only be cardinal directions or orthogonally. You'll score a bonus five points. After you play your cards, you will draw back up to four. And you can choose which combination of cards, which cards to get buildings or, or symbols. But you always have to have at least one of each. The, the natural state of things is to usually have one building and three symbols. That gives you kind of the most flexibility. But you can have three buildings and one symbol if you want, just as long as you have at least one of each. So you're gonna draw back up. So you have a hand of four, at least one of each type. And when the decks run out, of course, you'll reshuffle. Now, you also have two special abilities that you can use on your turn. You can use them both. 
This is the Joker. The Joker acts as a wild card. So if you use your Joker, you only have to, you can play one fewer card, a symbol card, and just flip that over to show it as being used. And then this counts as a card, a symbol card of any symbol you want. So you could flip over this and play a building card and play a building literally anywhere. I mean, matching the, the terrain. Or this and one symbol card to place upon anywhere in the row or symbol, uh, row or column matching that symbol. So that's a wild card. And this is an extra turn. After you play two cards, you can flip this over and play your other two cards. So you actually have two turns. You don't replenish cards in between, and at the end, you'll draw back up to four. Um, if somehow during that second turn you're able to get this back, you can't use it a third time. Two is the max. So these stay face down and used until you're able to reactivate them again. So let's talk about the different buildings. The train station can only be placed on the railway track spaces, and for any pawn adjacent to it, that player is going to score one point per pawn. So if blue had a bunch around here, I should point this out. And then somebody played, doesn't matter who, played this here, blue would score three points. And the player gets to replenish their extra turn marker. Likewise for the store, I always thought it was a general store, but I read the rules before this video and it turns out it's a warehouse. So store, anyway. It's the same for the Joker. You get one point for every pawn next to it, and you get to replenish your Joker. The post office scores three points. The port scores four points, but the catch with the port is it has to be adjacent to water. And in this case, diagonal counts. So you couldn't put a port here, but you could put a port here. That's diagonally touching water, and that's pretty good for blue. Blue's gonna score eight points. The church is kind of interesting, and I'll have to get some pawns here as an example. Let's say the church is already here, and a player places a pawn next to the church in one of the eight spaces around it. That player will score one point. If later on another player or the same player places another pawn on here, that player for that pawn is going to score two points. It's the number of pawns now uh, around the church. The church becomes more valuable the bigger the congregation. So the first pawn next to it is only going to score one, but the next pawn will score two, and the next pawn will score three, and so on. Now what happens if the pawns are already there and somebody puts a church right down in the middle? Well, you're going to count the number of pawns around that church, and each pawn is going to score its owner that many points. So by putting the church here, blue is going to score three points, but yellow is going to score six. That's how the church works. So it is actually possible, you know, if uh, yellow has, you know, yellow does something like this, right? And then later on, it's able to put a church in there. Each pawn is going to score eight points. That's 64 points, which is crazy. But by the way, if you see somebody who's starting to do that in the game, you probably want to get your pawns, either to block that really awesome space, or just put pawns next to it so that you benefit from whatever is going there too. Finally, the coal mines and the gold mines, they can only be placed on mountain spaces. Instead of granting points directly, the player will instead take one token for every pawn of theirs that's adjacent to it. For a coal mine, you'll take a coal, it's worth one to three points. And for a gold, you take a gold token, three to five points. And you take the token and you look at it and just keep it face down. And you'll add those points at the end of the game. So you're gonna keep playing like this, just clockwise around the table, until one of two things happen. Usually, in fact, I think pretty much every game I've played is like this. You're gonna play until one player runs out of pawns. You're still going to finish the rounds. So everybody has the same number of turns. It is also possible, if for some reason players are playing a ton more buildings than pawns, for uh, the buildings to run out. So if two, three, or four piles are depleted in a two, three, or four player game, then the game will end that way. 
I've played this game tons of times. I've never seen it. <laughs> but it is technically possible because what if people, for some reason, just don't put their pawns on the board and just put buildings? The game would last forever, right? So, uh, but usually you'll run out of pawns. And then at the end of the game, uh, the player will the players will also add up their coal and gold, and whoever has the most points wins. That's it. You're ready to play Oregon. So I asked my wife before this video why this is her favorite game of all time. And her response is, and I quote, because it's fun. For one thing, there's always something to do on your turn, right? Um, you're, you're placing pawns next to buildings and buildings next to pawns. And in that way, it's kind of neat to see little communities form almost because, you know, that's how kind of communities grow, right? Maybe there's a local um, mill or something or a mine and then a little community, you know, people move there to work in the mines. But then you see stores and stuff pop up to service those miners. And, and that's how a community forms, right? This sort of feedback loop of bringing in new people and then bringing in new buildings, which bring in more people and so on. Um, it's kind of neat to see that. They could have leaned into that a little bit more, but it's there and it's, it's neat to see. There's always something to do on your turn because you are limited in the cards you have, of course. You don't have full control, uh, but you do have a lot of flexibility. And because you're also usually keeping cards from turn to turn, you can kind of plan ahead a little bit. Well, I'm going to need this eagle, but I really need an eagle and a campfire. So why don't I play other cards first and hope I get a campfire? But even if you can't really find anywhere to go, like to place near buildings that'll score you good points, there's always something to do because you can always, at the very least, put pawns next to your other pawns with the eventual hope of connecting three of them and getting five points, which is a pretty nice bonus. So even if there's nothing obvious to do, you can always work towards something, which is a nice feeling. Having these special tiles, the uh, the one-time use, I mean, they're, you can replenish them, but the, the take an extra turn or having a joker just adds a little bit more flexibility, gives you a little bit more control. If you have, if you see a really good spot, right, to, to go there, but then of course you have to replenish. And the only way to replenish is to go to some kind of low scoring buildings and scoring there, but at least you'll get your, your bonuses back. And maybe you don't want to grant those bonuses to other players. So the positioning of the buildings is, is a, it's a nice little, I wouldn't call it a puzzle, but it's, it's, there's always things to think about on your turn, always. And do I use my extra turn? Do I, do I, that's a really good spot. I can't let other players get it. You know what? I'm going to use my joker just to make sure I go in there. And, but there's no stores on the map. So I might not get my joker back for a while. So you have these decisions, <clears throat> but it's in a night, nice, light, easily approachable game but still has a, a little bit of a crunchy decision-making and uh, it's a really nice balance in terms of a family strategy game of light, approachable versus still things to think about. You can't have a long-term strategy in the game if you're looking for that, it's not in here, but you can plan a turn or two in advance and, but it's mostly tactical. It's just, you know, these are the cards I have, what are my best scoring opportunities? There's a, a big variety of buildings um, you have the low scoring buildings, which score you um, uh, very few points, but allow you to replenish your special powers. You have the kind of more high scoring uh, stuff in the post office and the, the port, but the port is limited in where you can put it. And there's the church, which is which can be very high scoring, but you got to work at it a little bit, right? And you have the mines. There, I've seen some talk on BGG that um, pe some people consider the mines imbalanced, not compared to other things, but to each other. So there's the coal mine, which will give you one to three points at the end of the game for each coal token. And then you have the gold mine, which grants gold tokens, which grant you three to five points. Well, the gold mine is very obviously better than the coal mine. So some people complain about that, but you have to remember Buildings aren't owned by players, right? If I put down that building next, a gold mine, next to my pawn, yes, I'm getting one gold token, 
And if you had a coal mine and you put it next to your pond, you're getting one coal token and that's worse. But once they're on the board, they're open for everybody. Later on, maybe you'll be able to put more pawns next to the gold mine. So I don't see it as a problem at all, like at all. I think it's a really nicely designed game, a nicely developed game. It's, it's, um, it's just, it has a really nice kind of flow to it. Uh, as the board gets crowded, it gets a little bit more restrictive on what you can do. I do consider Oregon to be a Goldilocks game. Now this is a term I've used before. A Goldilocks game is a game that has a shared board and all players are playing onto the shared board, but it doesn't really scale for a number of players. So a two player game in the case of Oregon is very wide open. You can do a lot. You can go anywhere you want, but maybe it's not that, the opportunities aren't that great. But in a four player game, um, it's really crowded, right? Trying to find places to put your pawns that will actually score something can be a challenge. So actually the sweet spot is three. Not necessarily that the game is best with three. In my opinion, it's good with all the player counts, but that balance of having the control to do what you want, but having kind of um, some limitations and where you can go because of the crowdedness of the board, I find that balance is struck really nicely with three players exactly. And of course my family is three and we play Oregon all the time. I do want to give a little bit of pause. Now, there's, there's really nothing wrong with the game, but I want to give a little bit of a pause because of its current kind of status. It's, it's, it's not really a grail game. I wouldn't call it that, but it is hard to find now. And sometimes I worry, and I've because I've had this conversation on BGG, I think, with users in the past about this specific game. This game has been great for my family. We love it, we play it all the time. And when I tell people about our good experience, it makes people think, oh my God, this game sounds amazing. I have to go out and find this game, right? And, you know, not necessarily. You don't have to like, don't spend like $100 on this game, okay? If you can come across a copy and it's reasonably priced, go for it, it worked really well for us. And I think the reason it's hard to find now is the people who have the game aren't trading it away because they like it a lot. Um, there, is, there wasn't really a shortage of games out there in the market, but just the people who have them like it enough that they don't want to trade them or sell them. Um, but what happens is, is that when a game becomes kind of hard to find and you hear some people talk and go, oh, that game sounds really amazing, it kind of builds up a little bit of, not hype, but a little bit of buzz in maybe a player's mind thinking this game is great. We're always seeking that perfect gaming experience and you hear this and you think this game is great and you won't, maybe you wanna go out and, and seek it out and be thinking about paying top dollar for it and then you play it and it's fine. <laughs> it's a good game, but in your head, you maybe you built it up into something amazing, and then when you finally splurge on the money and you put it down, you play it, and it's a fine game, it's actually a disappointment. Because you're thinking, why did I spend all this money on this so-so game, right? Look, there's lots of games in the world like Oregon. If you can't find Oregon, there are other great games out there. You know, there were recent reprints of, uh, I think there's a recent reprint of Finca, which is not an extremely similar game. It's not as spatial as, as Oregon, but it's in that same family of games that was published by Hans M. Gluck. Um, Vikings, I think, is a little hard to find now, but it gets periodic reprints. Um, you know what? There's lots of great games kind of in this family, and you don't necessarily have to seek this one out as this is the game, right? You know, watch the how to play part, see if it's something that might interest you, and if you happen to see it in an auction and you can get it at a reasonable price, I would recommend it. But don't go nuts over it because I just feel like you'll, you'll, you'll build it up in your head and then you, you play it and it's a fine family strategy game. <laughs> but for us, it really, it really clicked, especially my wife. Uh, she al she's always asking to play this game. It's really a board gem for our family. Thanks for watching. Remember, older games like Oregon do not stop being good just because new games come out. Take care.